want to I want to want to remind you all that this this governor we are so honored to have her with us today but she is she speaks on the promise of education in a way that governors in our history have been speaking that she holds that value of education that has made North Carolina such a different state today than what it was many, many years ago and made us stand out in a way other states weren't able to do. Because of this governor, and I'm afraid the role she's going to play in our history, um, we are going to maintain our North Carolina. We are going to protect our North Carolina for our children and not let somebody take it and turn it into something else that isn't good for our young children. This conference was designed to do two things, to inspire and inform, and to make us better warriors as we stand with Governor Purdue and fight together to be sure that children and families and teachers and child care providers get what they need to be successful. And in keeping with that, one of my great heroes, our chair, the chair of the North Carolina Partnership for Children, Olsenov, who is a, a clearly a gentleman and a scholar, who is always teaching all of us, and I always learn something new from Olsen, who's a pediatrician and an advocate for children, who's been a community leader and has stepped up to help Governor Purdue and all of you um, make a difference for young children. So please welcome Olsen Huff as he introduces Governor Purdue. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, let me add my voice of welcome to your presence today. As I look out on this crowd, what an absolutely incredible picture you make, and what an exciting atmosphere you create by being here. When I look at you, I, I realize that with the number here, you're an entire town of people. And as you are a town, you bring with you the collective energy, the collective passion, and the collective wisdom that is so critical to the bedrock of caring, of health, of learning, and of total care for our children, for our younger citizens. So I'm not sure exactly what town to call you, but I think it would be the town of those who are always for our children. <clears throat> now when you leave here on Thursday, I have some hopes for you, and I hope that you will be even more passionate about what you're doing than you are now passionate about the care, the resources, and the intervention that's necessary to provide the stability for our children, and to send them on their way to a bright future. It's my hope that when you leave here on Thursday, you'll, be even, you'll have even more fire in your belly than you have now. And that fire in the belly is because you know you're part of a community, you're part of a movement, and you're part of a master plan that in spite of economic stresses and in spite, of, in spite of all the political maneuvering that we're dealing with, you will not, for the sake of our children, be undone. And so, as I bring to you a person this morning who also has that passionate fire in her belly for what we are doing, I want to just ask you briefly a question. Why is it that you really are here in the first place? What is that motivating, defining moment in your life, early in childhood, later in your adult life, that has given you that desire to have that passion of fire in your belly? Briefly, let me tell you where mine came from. I believe this to be the defining factor in my life. It was I was four years old holding tightly to my mother's hand as we trudged up in that dry, hot August day a hill in the southeastern mountains of Kentucky and followed the men in their best clothes that they owned, sweating and carrying a small box in which was the body of a newborn child. Intuitively, without being able to understand it, I knew 
that that child had died because there was no medical care available. Now, I don't know that I consciously ever planned that to be the defining moment of my life to guide me into medicine, but I know for a fact it was, and I hope that you have, and can claim during the time you hear your defining moment, just as I know that our governor has had those defining moments in her life. Now let me tell you a little bit about her. She's a native of southwest, western, of the mountains of southeastern West Virginia. Actually, and you don't know this, but my great-grandfather was born very close to where you came from, Governor Purdue. She is a veritable bulldog when it comes to passion about children. She has defined the work that we are able to be able to stand here and do today because of her early intervention in the state legislature to help get Smart Start started. She began her career here in North Carolina in Newburn as a school teacher. She earned her PhD. Unlike many of our governors, she is a talented and educated person. <laughs> I'm glad there are no other governors here this morning. But, uh, <laughs> she's the 73rd governor of North Carolina and the first woman to occupy this position. <laughs> Teacher, educator, passionate about children, supporter of those who are in their older ages and years of life, served in the state legislature in both the House and the Senate, served eight years as lieutenant governor, and in during that time, there's one thing that I think is very important that we know about. She chaired the Health and Wellness Trust Fund Commission, and during her time, she motivated that particular commission and designed a program which, for the first time in the history of North Carolina, reduced the incidence of teenage smoking. That's a very important thing in a tobacco state. Dad and her husband Bob have six grandchildren. I won't try to name them, but they also, I want you to make sure you understand they have two dogs as well. Um, I could go on and on, but uh, I think that we need to hear from her. I really am proud to introduce to you my friend, our governor, Beverly E. Spurdue. I just tried to tear Stephanie's microphone up. I wanted to move around. I, in my old age, I've gotten so I don't like to stand behind the podium anymore. I, so I apologize, Stephanie, that you won't be able to use the microphone after I finish up here. I'm not going to tear it apart. I'll just stay here and pout when I get back in the car. I want to welcome all of you folks who aren't from North Carolina to North Carolina. I happen to be able to tell you you're sitting in the best state in America. So enjoy your stay while you're here. And we have a little revenue challenge the way you might have in your states or countries or territories. So I would invite you to sneak away sometime during the next two days and do a little retail business across the hall. <laughs> And leave your sales tax in North Carolina, would you please? Uh, if you're going to buy it between now and next September, buy it here. The sales are good. I want you to help me one more time thank somebody who has been fundamentally critical to Smart Start. Uh, she has been tenacious. She has been uh, a leader. She's been bold. She's fought for the right things for kids and for families. She will argue with anybody in a skinny minute if she thinks it's going to do a disservice to Smart Start, and that's the kind of leader we need in North Carolina because the work you do in early childhood is the Lord's work. It's important work for the future of North Carolina's economy, and I'm glad to have Stephanie Fonjo as our leader. Thank you. 
Thank you. I got my mic. She doesn't want to see me pout when I get in the car. Now, I, I want to thank all of you who are here. There's two more people. We've already called a lot of names, and I apologize for that. But I do want you to know about this guy on the front row. You wouldn't be here today if it weren't for he and a man named Governor Jim Hunt. Now, I had a, they allowed me to be involved a teeny bit, but this was their work. Uh, Robin Britt, this man who was the Secretary of Health and Human Services during the birthday, the birth time, the pregnancy of Smart Start, uh, had an idea and showed it to Governor Hunt. And they convinced a lot of us that the best investment North Carolina could make would be into the children, the little bitty children of this state. Robin, we're, in, we're forever thankful to you for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And, and then let me talk to you about your new chair. I, I know those of you from out of the state won't have the opportunity to get to know him, but you can go home and tell your state's leaders and your board that you'd like somebody like him to lead your initiative, whatever it's called in your state. Olson Hoff is what we call in North Carolina a hero. He is a pediatrician. Uh, he's led much of the medical practice, all kinds of docs and nurses and healthcare people for years. He has a soul. And having a soul is really important when you take care of people, especially poor people. Olson Hoff has spent a life of research and writing and teaching and service and giving back to the people of North Carolina. When I came to him and said, Olson, I need a partner to help us combat teen smoking in North Carolina. This was back in the day, my friend, when you're sitting, if you don't know it, in the heart of tobacco land. This state was built on tobacco. And I went to Olson and the other members and I said, let's do this. There had never been an elected leader in the history of North Carolina who took on smoking and tobacco use. And there had never been a board who'd stand up with a leader dumb enough like me to take it on. This group of men and women led by Olson Huff never batted an eye. They stood up and said, Purdue, it is the right thing to do for the health and the welfare of our people. Now you cannot smoke nearly anywhere in North Carolina in public. It's the right thing. And some of the things that you do in Smart Start has been developed by folks like Olson and pediatricians. The work you do on child nutrition and prenatal care, the work you do on helping a kid have those eye tests and all those things that they need to have that little brain developed, folks like Olson and Robin and Stephanie understand what you do. Y'all, I don't know about your states, but in North Carolina, what we believe in is fundamentally at risk. Fundamentally at risk. And I, won't well, give you my big speech about why it's very important that you not only spend three days here, but why it's equally important, perhaps more so important, for those of you, especially from North Carolina, to get on your Blackberries or your iPhones or whatever your mobile is and text your legislators today. This afternoon, the House of Representatives will cast a vote on the future of small children in North Carolina. That vote is a very important vote for the future workforce of North Carolina because those children are the next generation's employees. And I don't know about you, but I understand in my soul that the little kid who comes to kindergarten, if they allow us to have kindergarten anymore after this budget year, when that little kid comes to kindergarten, if he or she comes sick, unprepared socially or emotionally or physically to adapt and to compete, the child never catches up. Uh, that's why Mort 4 is the next step after Smart 4. It is. It's absolutely the next step. And these group of folks in Raleigh, they've decided that Mort 4 isn't an academic program. They're putting it in Human Services, which is a great place for Smart Star, but it's not where an academic preschool program belongs because we all work together. We all work together. Stephanie and your leaders at your local level have done marvelous work, each of you in North Carolina, and I hope in the rest of the country, and we welcome you here, and we certainly welcome our friends from China. I've been to your country and intend to go back this fall. 
we want to take a little bit of the money in China and put it in North Carolina too. So we're busy growing jobs there. We are busy growing jobs there. The thing that we fundamentally understand that's worked so well in North Carolina is that each of you look different. There is no proper template for Smart Start. Each of you working with your own community group uh, that we crafted in these early days of Smart Start, because there are 100 counties in North Carolina. We are 100 different sets of people, and our children and our families have 100 or more different sets of needs. And those community councils allow those needs to be addressed with the funding you have. And you use that money to supplement other services like more for or daycare slots, all those things that are so important for working families in North Carolina. And especially all those things that are so important for families who don't have a gainfully employed worker in their family, the poor kid who depends totally on you and your service plethora for good care and a good opportunity. That's what you do. And that's why it's incumbent upon every one of you today and tomorrow and for the next three weeks to make a real fuss in the General Assembly. I'm not asking you to, mar to march and protest and to do things that are combative, excuse me, combative or radical. I'm asking you to exercise your rights as an American and as a North Carolinian. If you believe in something, stand up for it. And if you believe in Smart Start, stand up now. If you believe in Smart Start, stand up now. You know, I'm a, I'm a woman from Southwest Virginia. Olson didn't tell you that where I live is one of the poorest places in America. It's Appalachia. It's as poor as any place that you can ever imagine. And my parents uh, didn't have a lot of money when I grew up. Uh, there was no smart start then. There was no daycare then. I'm old enough to be before all of those things, even kindergarten. But I had this teacher and I had these parents who though they worked hard and who though neither of them had a high school diploma, my parents fundamentally understood that if somebody had to go to the doctor, it was going to be me. And they'd do without to make that happen. If there was going to be a dress on Easter Sunday, they'd do without. That's what many families in North Carolina do today. And they convinced me that I could be anything I wanted to be. If only I would get a good education, say my prayers at night, and work hard. And I'm standing before you today as the governor of North Carolina because of what education has allowed to happen to me. There are hundreds of millions of people in all your states who really deserve that same kind of opportunity. And Smart Start, as we craft this program in North Carolina called Ready, Set, Go, what that means to me in terms of education is that you are the ready in Ready, Set, Go. You take those children as they start, and you help give them a shot. You don't promise them that they'll all be successful. You don't promise them that some of them won't end up being uh, hard hit by life's knocks. You promise them that you're going to give them a start. You're going to help them be ready for whatever it is life has to offer to them. And then the set is really important in Ready, Set, Go. The set is when you get that child into school. And when a teacher, we want really good teachers in North Carolina and America who have high expectations, they will, oh yeah, come on, clap for that. You, you want a teacher who doesn't look at the kid's zip code or wallet. You want a teacher who sees a fine human being who has all of the potential in the world and you want high expectations. And you hope there's some backup from a mom or a dad or a grandmom or a granddad, somebody, some adult, to help that child. And if there isn't, the power of what you've begun at Smart Start is that child will likely have another adult already in his or her life to help them get through those bad times. And there are bad times. And then the go is for our school system to be sure that that child learns enough and stays on grade level with reading and writing that he or she 
can graduate high school. Fundamentally, you've got to graduate high school. And you need to tell every mama and daddy you come in contact with, regardless of who they are or where they live. Kids have got to graduate in high school. Or China, these two individuals here learning about our early childhood, will try to eat our lunch economically. We're not going to let that happen, guys. We're glad you're here, but we're not going to let you eat our lunch. And it's all about education. We need our kids to graduate career or college ready and then we need for them to go to work. All of the work that you do, you all, it's not a sweet little social pro program thought up by people like me and Robin and Stephanie and Olson and some of you all. It's not a do-good program. The work you do is an investment in North Carolina. Purely and simply, the best economic development incentive we can ever provide in the state of North Carolina or in this country is to have a child become a skilled and doable worker when they enter that period of their life. And that starts with you. It starts with each of you. Now, I want to I, I wanna thank you all for being here. There are more than a 1,000 of you. And you've got three days of hard work. But you've also got three days to talk to each other and to collaborate and to remember why that work you're doing is so important. I have this young guy on my staff. Uh, 24, 25. I've never asked him because I figure that might be against the law and I don't want to get, <laughs> get written up for age discrimination. But um, he came into my office several weeks ago. And do you remember when you were 24 or 25? Some of you are here. I can see you in the audience. And, you were so idealistic. Do you all remember that time when you believed that there was nothing at all that could harm you or your family? There was only joy and op it was just so good and so easy. We never thought about money or recessions or jo it was just it was just nice. You were so young and naive. And he sat across from me at my desk and he said, Governor, in a very non challenging, very respectful way, I guess he was afraid I'd fire him if he was disrespectful. Uh, he looked at me and he said, Governor, do you know, have you thought about this time that we're living in? Now, I've doing a, been doing a whole lot of thinking. We've had the hardest economic times in this country since the Great Depression. North Carolina has suffered. You all know somebody who's lost a job. My son-in-law has lost a job, had to declare bankruptcy in Georgia. I mean, that's hit all of us. We understand the challenges of these times. And we also are grateful that North Carolina is bouncing back and that America is bouncing back. And we love the fact that we killed Osama bin Laden. We love that fact. But this young man says to me, Governor, have you thought much about this? He said, the, the history, the history of North Carolina, it could be your state or your country, just add in the name, the history of North Carolina is still being written. I've been thinking a whole lot about that, you all. I hope you're thinking about it because the times that we're in right now with the decisions that are being made or suggested in the legislature are generational damages to this state, to our smart start, our preschool, our public school system, our university, our community college system. That means that our next generation of workers will be totally incapable of competing in a global economy. So this young man looks at me and says, Governor, do you realize that the history of North Carolina is still being written? I urge you all to think about that as you watch and listen and observe and try to get involved in what's going on in Raleigh or in your own states. And then he looked at me and he put his hand out. And he did it in a non-threatening, non-judgmental way. He didn't point. He just put his hand out and he said, and Governor, this chapter belongs to us. This chapter belongs to us. I don't go to bed. I don't get up now without thinking about that. It is what has begun to motivate me. Someday, 
somebody will be sitting in this chairs, these chairs long after we're gone. None of us have what we have today forever. We will all pass away and somebody else will take up this mantle for our people and for our economy and for our state and our country. But there will be those who remember what we had in 2008 and 9 and 10 and the work that had been done since the 90s on this magnificent early childhood program called Smart Start. There will be those who look in the books and think about what it took to embed this in the fabric of this great state, Stephanie. There will be those then who have to read that chapter that we're writing now. What happens to these fundamental guarantees to a smart start in life? If we don't do our job today, the history of North Carolina is still being written, and this chapter belongs to all of us in this room. Another way of saying it, my country mama from Southwest Virginia would say it this way. She'd said, Bevy, I want you to remember you've finally grown up and you're the adult in the room. You're in charge. Y'all, you you're the adults in this room and you're in charge of what's going to happen to these millions of children who come after us. Thank you and God bless.